welcome to lecture 2c in today's video we are dedicating our time for solving some exercises with respect to instruction pipeline as well as hazards in instruction pipeline with the background of the theoretical knowledge that we learned over the past few lectures now it's time for us to dig deeper into some of the design concepts and try to understand from from a design point of view without much delay let us start solving the problems so here is the first two question that we would like to solve today the time delay of various segments in a four stage pipeline are t1 equal to 35 nanosecond t2 equal to 30 nanosecond t3 equal to 40 nanosecond and t4 equal to 45 nanosecond so i am talking about a four stage pipeline and the latency associated with four stages t1 t2 t3 and t4 are given here the interface register delay time is t equal to 5 nanoseconds so we know that in a pipeline in between two pipeline stages we are going to add a pipeline interface register which here the delay on the interface register is 5 nanosecond how long would it take to complete 100 instructions in the pipeline assume that there is no data dependency between the instructions so first we have to understand that in this particular problem a pipeline with four segments of varying time delay is being given now the general principle is it's based upon the longer latency segment that determines the clock cycle time so if you have a b c and d look at which one is the largest and that is going to trigger what is the time period at which the new data movement happens from one pipeline stage register into the another with that background let's see these are the stages stages 1 2 3 and 4 as given in the question t1 equal to 35 t2 equal to 30 t3 equal to 40 and t4 equal to 45 these are the four stages that we have and in between you have the pipeline register each of having a delay of 5 so at uh, the end of stage number 1 after 35 nanosecond the result is written into the pipeline register in between like that at the end of 30 nanosecond stage 2 write the result into the pipeline register end of 40 and end of 45 stages 3 and 4 will write into the corresponding pipeline register so they all will write into the next pipeline register arbitrarily at different time depending upon the delay but the key concept is when will the reading happens from here to here or when will i take a new data they all are triggered with a common clock so we have to understand there is a common clock that is going to be given and this common clock is based upon the largest delay that you have so if you look at this pipeline cycle is whatever is the maximum that plus 5 because 5 is the interface register delay so 45 is the maximum one this is the maximum so 45 plus 5 so this 5 will come in each stage so 50 nanosecond is the pipeline cycle so one clock cycle in the pipeline is now 50 nanosecond at every 50 nanosecond whatever is available in the previous pipeline register its data is been read processed and then you are going to write writing completely depends upon an asynchronous time but reading from the pipeline register triggering of the new pipeline read always happen at intervals of 50 nanosecond now with this background there is a question how long would it take to complete 100 cycles in the pipeline so now let us try to see what is happening in each of the clock cycle for example let us write the clock cycle number as 1 2 3 like that on the x axis and we'll take the first instruction let's say we have four stages we will define these two four stages in the pipeline as stage 1 2 3 and 4 so in one clock cycle so in clock cycle number 1 stage 1 of the first instruction is over then stage 2 will happen in the second clock cycle like that at the end of the fourth clock cycle the first instruction complete since there is no data dependency between the instruction the pipeline the effect you can see that second instruction started clock cycle 2 and end at 5 third instruction start at 3 and end at 6 fourth instruction start as 4 and end at 7 so hereafter after clock cycle number 4 at every cycle one one instruction is 
getting over. So, then we have another 99 more instructions. So, if you look into the first instruction is getting over at clock cycle number 4 and then we have 99 more instructions. Each one will be taking one more additional cycle. So, 103 clock cycles you will be able to complete up the operation the complete 100 the instructions are going to get over, but that is in terms of clock cycle. So, how much is your one clock cycle? One pipeline cycle has been defined as 50 nanosecond. So, 103 into 50 that is 5150 nanosecond is the time at which 100 instructions complete their operation. So, in short what we did? We were trying to find out what is a pipeline cycle that is been governed by what is that segment which is having maximum latency plus the interface register value, access value and that we get and accordingly we got the clock cycle time and then you split up, you get the pattern by which it is going to get over. Here then there is no data dependency, every instruction will take 4 clock cycle, first one will get over at 4 and thereafter every clock cycle one more instruction is getting complete. So, at end of 103 clock cycles everything would be over. So, altogether 5150 nanosecond is the time that is required to complete 100 instructions in the given pipeline. Let us now move into the next question. Here four statements are given. Which of the following statements are true? So, four statements. Statement 1 is the raw data hazard could be reduced by operand forwarding. Let us take each one one by one. The second statement is a normal in order 5 stage MIPS pipeline can achieve an IPC larger than 1. The third statement is for a MIPS instruction store R2 16 of R3. Some contents stored in its ID EX pipeline register will bypass the EX unit directly to the EX MEM pipeline register. And the fourth statement is a normal 5 stage in order risk pipeline without operant forwarding can have row and war hazards. So, let us try to take one by one. So, these are the four choices given. Our question is which of them is true? So, four choices are given A, B, C and D. Let us try to figure it out. So, the first question is about raw data hazard could be reduced by operand forwarding. This is what we can see. We have raw data hazards here where there is a direct raw data hazard on R1. First instruction will produce a result on R1 which is in turn required in the second, third, fourth instructions. And we have seen the operand forwarding concept from the output of ALU to the input of ALU here data is forwarded. From output of MEM stage to the input of ALU data is been forwarded. So, with this forwarding we can complete the instructions in its assigned time slot. There are no stalls that is coming in this case. So, the statement raw data hazard could be reduced by operand forwarding is true. Now, let us go into the second one. A normal in order 5 stage MIPS pipeline can achieve an IPC larger than 1. So, what is IPC means? IPC is instructions per clock cycle. So, this is an in order pipeline wherein every clock cycle one more instruction is being fetched and all the instructions will be performing the operations inside pipeline in order fetch followed by decode followed by ex mem and write back so they also complete things in the same order itself so now if you look since it is an in order normal pipeline we will fetch only one instruction in a clock cycle and we could complete only one instruction per clock cycle so, the IPC instructions per cycle or the CPI clock cycle per instruction is ideally 1 if there is no data dependency at all. Now, the statement is mentioned that a normal in order 5 stage pipeline can achieve an IPC larger than 1. An IPC larger than 1 means you should be able to complete more than 1 instruction per clock cycle which is impossible in this case because I am fetching only 1 instruction and it is not possible to complete more than one instruction at any given clock cycle. So, the possibility of achieving IPC larger than 1 is not possible. So, the second statement is false. Now, the third statement for a MIPS instruction, I am going to talk about a store instruction where the content of RT, R2 has to be moved to a memory location whose address is given by 16 of R3. And here some contents that is been stored in the ID EX pipeline register will bypass the EX unit directly to the EX MEM pipeline register. So, let us take the 5 stage risk instruction pipeline data path and our focus is now on a store instruction store R2 16 of R3. Let us try to see what happens in this various stages. 
During the instruction fetch stage, the instruction is being brought into the IF ID pipeline register. Now, what we have is you are going to perform a decoding and at the same time reading of the registers that has been happened. The meaning here is 16 of R3. So, 16 plus content of R3 that will give me the effective address and R2 is the value that is the source operand. So, the content of R2 has to be stored into the address pointed by 16 plus contents of R3. We know that in a 5 stage risk pipeline, any reading of registers happen in the ID stage. So, the content of R2 as well as R3 are read from the register file and they are fed into the ID plus EX pipeline register and the sign extended value. So, here as part of the instruction, the value 16 is part of the instruction. So, that move to the sign extended field. So, the 16 also will come here out of which this R3 and 16 will go into the ALU to compute the effective address. So, what will happen to R2? R2 is not used in the EX stage because we need the content of R2 to be written into the memory since it is a store instruction content of R2 is needed only at this point. So, how do we move from the ID EX pipeline register into this one? So, they will go through this. So, in this case some contents that is already present in the ID EX pipeline register. So, what are the things that is there? The content of R2, content of R3, the value 16, the opcode plus control bits all are present inside the ID EX pipeline register wherein R3 and 16 will go into ALU to perform addition to get the effective address whereas, the content of R2 will be bypassing the EX stage into the EX mem pipeline register. So, the value of R2 will bypass from ID EX pipeline register to the EX mem pipeline register bypassing the EX unit. So, the statement that is mentioned that some contents stored in ID EX pipeline register, what is their content? The content of R2 will bypass the EX unit directly into the EX mem pipeline register and that is true. The R2 contents is going to bypass. So, the third statement is true. Now, let us go to the fourth statement, a normal 5 stage in order risk pipeline without operand forwarding can have raw hazard as well as war hazard. So, you have to understand it is an in order risk pipeline, there is no operand forwarding. So, consider this case, in this case we have a raw hazard here. So, there is no operand forwarding, so it will create a raw hazard for sure and this is actually a war hazard. You are going to read from R3 and the subsequent instruction is going to write into R3. Since it is an in order pipeline, the subtraction instruction is never going to bypass the add. Only after the add completes all its 5 stages, then only the subtraction will be performing these 5 stages. So, ideally something that is happening as a read of R3 and in instruction add and a write that is going to be performed on R3 in the instruction subtraction, they will never get exchanged. So, the, in this case R3 will not have any war hazard because of in order execution, a normal 5 stage in order execution. Similarly, the same happens with R4. Even though it may looks like right after read is possible, since I am not interchanging any of the instruction, there is no parallel overlapping that is also going to come, your war hazard will never happen. But whereas, a raw hazard would be there. This war hazard is not happening because of in order execution. So, the fourth statement a normal 5 stage in order risk pipeline without operand forwarding can have raw and war hazard is, is false. So, now if you look at all the 4 possibilities, 1 is true and 3 is true whereas, uh, 2 and 4 are false. So, the question which of the following statement is true? Statement number 1 and statement number 3 are the only true cases in this. So, what we were doing here? We were trying to analyze 4 different statements which are pertaining to instruction pipeline and its hazard. One by one we took each one of them. We will be able to answer these kind of questions only if your understanding about instruction pipeline is clear and what happens during various stages, especially in terms of hazards in the way how it is being operated. I hope these kind of statements what we deeply analyzed now will be useful for your better understanding about instruction pipeline. Let us now continue with the next set of questions. So, here is a numerical question related to 
pipeline versus a non pipeline design given a non pipeline architecture running at 1 gigahertz that takes 5 clock cycle to finish an instruction it was later converted to a 5 stage pipeline operating at 800 megahertz so once you run an unpipelined instruction pipeline or a normal one an unpipelined design operating at 1 gigahertz wherein each instruction will take 5 clock cycle to complete now the same design i am going to convert to a pipeline design since we you add interface register for pipeline it is not possible to operate at the same clock so the clock speed re reduced to 800 megahertz now when you go for pipelining since the instructions are parallelly overlapping there are potential possibilities of stalling a stall of 70 cycles happen in 2% of memory instruction and a stall of 2 cycle happen in 20% of the branch instruction we just had an introduction of branch instruction in our previous video okay so some kind of a stalling that happens 70 cycle stalling only for 2% of memory instruction and 2 cycles of stalling only for 20% of branch instruction so these are the two kind of stall that this pipeline will encounter out of the total instruction 30% are memory instruction and 20% are branch instruction so this will give the split up how much is the memory instruction and how much are branch instruction so what is the actual speed up obtained by the pipeline so the cpi of the unpipelined design given by cpi of up unpipelined design is 5 so the clock cycle time of the unpipelined design is like based upon 1 gigahertz so it's 1 nanosecond is the clock cycle time now the cpi of pipeline so when you go for a pipeline design the difference is if there is no stalling at all then the ideal cpi is 1 every clock cycle one instruction is supposed to get over so it takes on an average one clock cycle to complete an instruction but in the case of a pipeline we may get a stall due to dependency due to hazards and all that's exactly what we are seeing here so in this question we have two types of stall one that is been called is causing due to memory stalls the second one is causing due to control hazards so to get what is the cpi with the pipeline execution it is typically defined as ideally one the base cpi and then wherever we are experiencing the stall here we have two types of stall they are first one is your memory stalls per instruction and second one is the branch stall plus instruction so cpi pipeline is defined as base cpi plus stall cpi and the stall cpi is defined here we have two types of stall memory stalls as well as branch stalls so what is the clock cycle time in pipeline since we operate in 800 megahertz then the clock cycle is going to be 1.25 nanosecond then let us compute how much is memory stalls we have total of 70 cycles of stalling for 2 percent of memory instruction and there are total of 30 percent of instructions that are memory instruction so 30 percent of instructions are memory out of that 20 percent will create sorry 2 percent will create so this is 0 0.02 2 percent will create stalls how much stalls 70 clock cycle of stall so 0 0.3 into 0 0.02 kindly note the mistake 0 0.02 into 70 plus when it comes to branches 20 percent are branches and 20 percent of the branch instruction will create two cycle stalling so when you simplify it's just 1 plus 0 0.42 plus 0 0.08 so 1.5 is the cpi of the pipeline design now the question that is been asked is how much is the speed up now how do you compute speed up we have two design one is the unpipelined design where each instruction will take five clock cycle and one clock cycle is defined as one nanosecond in the pipeline design each instruction will take roughly 1.5 clock cycle and your clock cycle time is 1.25 nanosecond because we operate at 800 megahertz so ideally when you look at what is the speed up that you are going to get it is defined by the execution time of an instruction in an unpipelined design divided by execution time of an instruction in a pipeline design and what is execution time what is cpi cycles required per instruction into how much is one clock cycle so let us see how it is speed up is defined as execution time of the unpipelined divided by execution time of pipeline so what is unpipeline cpi of unpipeline into clock cycle time of unpipeline that is called execution time of unpipeline with respect to one instruction divided by the cpi of the pipeline into clock cycle time of the pipeline so further division is 
CPI of unpipelined is 5, clock cycle time is 1 nanosecond divided by 1.5 into 1.25. So, you get 2.66 is the speed up. So, the pipeline design is 2.66 times faster than the unpipelined design. Let us try to understand how we solved this. The concept was very simple. We had the unpipeline design wherein there is no stalling that is going to happen. We assume that there is no stalling that is going to happen here and stalling is only for the pipeline design. In unpipeline design, CPI is equal to the number of clock cycle required to complete an instruction. It is 5. In pipeline design, the base CPI plus stall CPI we computed. Stall happened due to two categories in this question. One is due to the memory stall, second one is due to the branch stalls. You add up them based upon the proportionate fractions, obtain the CPI value and then the clock cycle time is different and then take a ratio of the execution time, execution time of unpipeline to execution time of pipeline and that is what the speed up that you are going to obtain because execution time of unpipelined is more than that of execution time of the pipeline. Let us try to solve one more of the same type so that it will be more thorough. The next question given a non-pipeline architecture running at 1.5 gigahertz, here also it takes 5 cycles to finish an instruction. You want to make it pipelined with 5 stages due to hardware overhead. The pipeline design will operate only at 1 gigahertz. So, from 1.5 gigahertz, it is going to come down to 1 gigahertz. Here also we have stalls. Let us see what are the category of stalls. 5 percent of memory instruction call as causing a stall of 50 cycles. 30 percent of branch instruction cause a stall of 2 cycles. Load ALU combination cause a stall of 1 cycle. So, we have seen that there is a data hazard whenever there is a load instruction. Immediately after that, there is an ALU instruction which make use of the load data. Even if you use operand forwarding, there will be stall. So, here we have 1 cycle of stall for all load ALU combination. Assume that in a given program, there exists 20 percent of branches. So, we already saw that 30 percent of branch instruction will cause a stall of 2 cycles, but we have total of 20 percent of the instruction mix is branch. 30 percent are memory instruction, 10 percent of instructions are load ALU combinations. So, what is the speed up of the pipeline design over the non pipeline design? Same thing, first we have to compute the CPA of unpipelined, it is 5, 1 gigahertz equal to 0 0.67 nanosecond, and whereas the pipeline design is operating at 1 gigahertz, so that is uh, 1 nanosecond. So, 1.5 gigahertz versus 1 gigahertz as the clock cycle difference between the unpipelined and the pipeline design. So, execution time of unpipelined is CPI into clock cycle time. So, 5 into 0 0.66 nanosecond. So, each instruction will take roughly 3.33 nanoseconds to complete. Now, the effective CPI of the pipeline design is defined as base CPI plus stall CPI. What are the kind of stalls? You have memory stalls, you have branch stalls, you have load ALU stalls. How much it is? Memory constitute of 30 percent of instruction, but only 5 percent of the memory instructions are creating stalls. How much? 50 cycles. So, 0 0.3 into 0 0.05 into 50. That is the total number of memory stalls per instruction. Coming to branches, we have already seen that in the case of branch, we experience 2 cycles of stall. So, the fraction is 20 percent of 30 percent. So, that will incur as 2 cycle and then 10 percent of the instructions are load ALU which will incur a 1 cycle stall. So, the base CPI of 1 is being added. Together if you add, you will get 1 plus 0 0.75 plus 0 0.12 plus 0 0.1 that is going to give you 1.97 is the clock cycle. So, what is the execution time in pipeline? The CPI into clock cycle time. Clock cycle time since we operate at 1 gigahertz it is 1 nanosecond. So, 1.97 that is the CPI obtained into 1. So, 1.97 nanosecond per instruction. So, the speed up is nothing but it is a ratio between them. So, 3.33 divided by 1.97 same like the previous question here we are doing it in terms of execution time. So, the pipeline design will be 1.69 times faster than the unpipelined design. We now move into the next problem. So, in our next problem, we are talking about a particular case. We have some 2000 instructions that is being given in the sequence. They are load add, load add combinations as given. A program has 2000 instruction in the sequence, load add, load add like that. We have total of 2000 instructions. So, 1000 
load and 1000 add that are intermingled. Now, what is the peculiarity? The add instruction depends on the load instruction right before it. So, this add is depending on this load, this load is dependent on this add and the load instruction depends on the add instruction right before it, not for the first one, but everything after that. If the program is executed on a 5 stage pipeline, what would be the actual CPI with and without operand forwarding technique? So, let us try to understand what has been given in this problem. We have a program that consists of 2000 instruction, load, add, load, add like that. So, first you load a value, that value is to be used in the next add instruction. The resultant of add may be used for next computation of the address of the next load. So, it may be a sequence of pointers that is being given, maybe that is the idea of this program. Now, every add instruction is having a dependency on the load previously. Similarly, every load except the very first load, every load is dependent on the result of the previous add instruction. So, unless the data is obtained, we cannot do. Now, there is a trade off. What would be the CPI if you enable operand forwarding? What would be the CPI if you are not going to enable operand forwarding? Let us try to analyze this particular case and see what are the CPI numbers in this both scenarios. So, first we will take the case of without operand forwarding. So, what happens? The ID of the nth instruction can start only after the WB, the right back stage of the n minus 1th instruction. So, look at the case, we have load add, load add combinations. So, the first load will happen like this, 5 stages, IF, ID, EX, MEM and write back. So, first load will get over at clock cycle number 5. Now, this add has a dependency on load and there is no operand forwarding. So, what does it mean? The value can be used only after the write back is over. That is the ID of the nth instruction. ID of the second instruction can have only after the WB of the first instruction. So, in this case, since all of them are dependent, this add is dependent on the load like that. Each load is depending on the previous add. At every stage, the ID can happen only after the WB of the previous one is over. So, you can see that this is the dependency. Since there is no operand forwarding, we have to wait for the previous instruction to complete its result writing in the register and then only the ID of the next instruction can read it from register since there is no operand forwarding. So, what will happen? Each instruction will have a stalling of 3 or if you take the pattern, there are 3 stalls in each instruction. Instructions reach WB or the right back stage at clock cycles 5, then 9, then 13 like that. So, it is a progression 5, 9, 13, 17 that is the sequence in which it goes. Last instruction that is the add will be the last instruction DHS WB. So, the first instruction will complete at clock cycle number 5. Thereafter, we have 1999 instructions. Each will take another 4 more. So, from 5 to 9, it is 4. From 9 to 13, it is another 4. 13 to 17, it is another 4. So, each instruction will take an additional 4 cycles. So, that will give total of 8001 clock cycles are required in order to complete. 2000 instruction that is this given particular program. So, what is CPI? It takes 8001 cycles to complete 2000 instruction. So, it is roughly 4.005. So, it is basically the base CPI is 1 like what we have seen and the stall CPI is 3 because we encounter 3 stalls. So, base CPI of 1 plus stall CPI of 3 that is roughly 4 is the CPI. Now, when you go to with operand forwarding, Every add after a load has a stall. So, we know that there is a load instruction and immediately after that there is an add instruction. Even though we do an operand forwarding, still there is a one cycle delay. But if there is a load immediately after an add with operand forwarding, I can completely handle the data, the dependency. But load after add do not have a stall at all. So, look at this case. We have the first load instruction that is completing at clock cycle number 5, but the add cannot happen. It is the, the peculiarity is the EX stage from the output of the MEM stage there is operand forwarding to the EX stage. So, 
there is one cycle delay that happens. So, id can be either placed here also there is no problem, but before e x there will be a stall either here or here. So, there is one stall that is going to happen for every add immediately after a load. The same thing that you can see here. Here you have w b and there is an e x. Now, what will happen to the load add combination? In this case your load value depends upon the VAT. So, this is a direct E x to E x combination. The load instruction wanted to make use of the data that has been produced by the add. Add will produce the result at the end of ALU that can be directly forwarded to the input of the ALU because load wanted to make use of it in its effective address computation. So, there would not be any stall for a load instruction. So, if you look at the pattern at clock cycle 5 first two instruction get over then there is a stall clock cycle 7 add gets over 8 next load get over 1 stall at 10 the add will get over like that the sequence go. So, instruction reads w b at clock cycles 5, 7, 8, 10, 11, 13 where the red color indicate the clock cycles at which the load instructions are getting over and the blue color indicates the clock cycles at which the add instructions are getting over. So, the last instruction is add reach the w b. So, if you take the first add it will complete at 7, second add on 10, third add on 13, fourth add on 16. So, if you take only the add instruction then first one will complete on 7. I have another 999 add out of 2000 instruction 1000 of them are load, 1000 of them are add. Now, since add is my last instruction when will the program get over? First add completes on clock cycle 7. Thereafter there is a delay of 3 cycles for every subsequent add. I have another 999 add more. So, that will take up to total of 3004 clock cycles. So, what is going to be CPI? It takes 3004 clock cycles to complete 2000 instructions. So, it is 1.40 or if you look at you encounter 1 stall for every 2 instruction. So, what is the number of stalls per instruction? It is 0.5. So, base CPI is 1 and stall CPI is 0 0.5. That is why we get the value 1.5 as the CPI. So, what was the approach that has been used in this case? We were trying to see the get the pattern and what all clock cycles which are the instruction getting over and then accordingly we were trying to see in what way the pattern is been generating. So, with operand forwarding and without operand forwarding separately we understood look at what is the dependency between a load and an add, what is the dependency between an add and a load. In the first case without operand forwarding every time there is a stall of 3 whereas in the second case only between one pair there is a stall between the other two combination there is no stall at all and accordingly we are able to deduce the number of stalls. Let us now go into the next problem consider the sequence of instructions below and identify which of the following statements is true. So, R 1 to R 6 are CPU registers. So, you have an instruction add R 4 R 2 R 3 sub R 4 R 5 R 3 mul R 5 R 4 R 2 and add R 6 R 5 and R 1. So, the statements are there is a war hazard in R 5 and a wav hazard in R 3. So, you have to look at the statement in totality is it true or false. Second is there is a row hazard in R 4 and a war hazard in R 2. Third is there is a wav hazard in R 4 and a row hazard in R 5 and the last one is there is a row hazard in R 4 and a wav hazard in R 5. Let us look them one by one. What are the cases in which the hazard happens? So, clearly we can say that this R 4 and R 4. So, there is a wow hazard in R 4. This is R 4. Then if you look into the next combination, this is a row hazard. So, R 4 has a row hazard also in R 4. So, this is the next combination of R 4. Now, if you look into R 5, there is a row hazard in R 5. Then similarly, if you look the, this combination, there is a war hazard in R 5 and R 2, there is no problem because both are source operant, R 3, both are source operant. So, it will not be there. So, here we have 4 hazards as follows, war hazard in R 4 like what has been mentioned between I 1 and I 2. So, for ease of understanding, let me clear this. So, the first type of hazard is we have wow hazard in R 4, these two. 
in instruction I1 and I2, we have a row hazard in R4 for instruction I2 and I3. So, what is this row hazard? Let me use a different color to represent the row hazard. This is a row hazard. Row hazard for instruction I2 and I3. War hazard in I R5, but at the end we have one more row hazard in R5. So, this is another row hazard that is there and then we have a war hazard. So, the war hazard is in R5 for instruction I2 and I3. So, this is creating my war hazard. So, if you look at all these patterns, there is a war hazard in R5, yes, but there is a war hazard in R3, this is wrong. Second statement, there is a row hazard in R4. We know that there is a row hazard in R4 and there is a war hazard in R2, that is wrong. The third statement, there is a wow hazard in R4, yes, and there is a row hazard in R5. We have a row hazard in R5, so both are true. There is a row hazard in R4, we have a row hazard in R4 and a wow hazard in R5, we do not have a wow hazard in R5. So, this is the answer. The third one is the correct one. So, we are trying to analyze what are the various type of hazards, the raw hazards, the war hazard and the wow hazards. Okay. So, before we conclude, just a quick summary of what we did. We were trying to solve some numerical problems with respect to pipeline and hazard analysis. We started with various pipeline segments having different operational latency and trying to find out how much time it will take. And then we took few statements, true or false statement, trying to understand what are the features and characteristics of various pipelines and hazard statements. And then we solve two numerical problem. It is basically a comparison between a pipeline design versus an unpipeline design. And the last one, we were trying to see, to understand from a given set of statements in a program, to, to find out where we have raw hazard, where we have war hazard, and where we have wow hazard. So, with this we come to the end of this tutorial session where we were trying to understand deeper about analysis of pipeline and hazards. Thank you.